So I'm doing something completely original. I'm doing a car video comic review. Nobody's ever done that before. I I copyrighted it. Um, so this is Green Lantern Earth One Volume One, and the Earth One series is a series of comics that DC is doing. Actually, they're OGN, the original graphic novels, and it's basically completely reimagining classic superheroes. I think Green Lantern is the fifth one that they've done. First one was Superman. Then they had Batman, then they had Teen Titans, then they had Wonder Woman uh, late last year, or actually the year before that. And now they've got Green Lantern Earth 1. And when I saw previews for this, I was pretty excited about it. Um, I actually thought it came out not this past Wednesday, but uh, tomorrow. Uh, so I, it, that was why I wasn't in the pull list video, was because I just flat out didn't know that it was out. <laughs> um, so... I was pretty excited about this because I just like seeing them try new things. The whole idea behind the Earth One series is that it's comics that are, are kind of like done for like a movie or done for a TV show. Like, uh, I I didn't particularly like Batman Earth One, and actually listening to Crumble Point talk about it, it turns out that uh, <laughs> it turns out that Jeff Johns actually basically hates Batman. So when Jeff Johns and Gary Frank did Batman Earth One, it was it was by somebody who hates. <laughs> Batman, and, and that actually kind of came through in it. But even though I didn't like it, it does look like that the TV show Gotham used a lot from Batman Earth One because, like, th there's a lot of elements to it that are uh, obviously inspired by that. Um, Man of Steel didn't take a whole lot from Superman Earth One, but it probably would have been better if they if they did. Like when Superman Earth One came out, I remember a lot of people who didn't read comics were talking about how. Superman was emo now, and I, I kind of took them at their word and didn't read it till years after it came out, and when I did, I was actually really surprised by it. It was J. Michael Straczynski on writing, and uh, Jesus Zayas? I don't know, a pretty big-time artist who did the art on it. Uh, and that's one thing that kind of separated all these uh, Earth-1 books, is that they were done by really well-known people. Um, J. Michael Straczynski, Jeff Johns, Gary Frank on Batman. I don't know who did the Teen Titans one, because I never read it, but Wonder Woman was Grant Morrison and Yannick Paquette. So a lot of big-time recognizable names in the comic world. These names here, I don't know who these people are. Uh, both Car Gabriel Hardman and Corinna Becko. I, I don't... I've never heard of them. They are credited... Both credited as writing. And Gabriel Hardman did the art. And honestly, I just read this, and I'm still not 100% sure how I feel about it. But I just feel like a video ought to be made about it just because, just because, like I said, I like them trying something new. Even if there are a lot of elements of this I didn't like, I still overall liked the idea. I liked what they were going for. The one thing that kind of separates this one from the previous ones that I've read is that all those other ones are trying to do various classic heroes in a contemporary, uh, modern world. And... This one is trying to do uh, Green Lantern in the near future, and I think that's going to limit its appeal. Um, I think the year is supposed to be like 2045, 2050, something like that. Uh, basically, Earth has apparently been taken over by a one-world government led by a fascistic military. Uh, dude, I don't really know. They're kind of vague about it, but it's not good. It doesn't seem to be... To their credit, it doesn't seem to be a, a whole, you know, this is Trump's America type of thing. It seems to be more like a classic science fiction, uh, you know, fascist military takeover sort of thing. So we open with this space mining uh, station here where they're mining an asteroid in Earth's solar system. And this is one thing that I kind of have to take issue with is that this is portrayed as though it's a bad thing. As though, Sorry, I don't know how... The book is really stiff. The hardcover, so turning the pages is actually a little bit difficult. Um, so we see the art here, and that's Hal Jordan right there, standing on this asteroid. And this is, the whole asteroid mining thing is portrayed like it's a bad thing. Um, and I, I just don't get that. It's like, this is one of the big, exciting things about space exploration right now. And there's also a lot of putting down of private space travel. And it's like, NASA has been setting its sights lower and lower for decades now. It's if There's no reason that we couldn't be on Mars right now. But it's not NASA that's trying to go to Mars. It's Elon Musk. It's SpaceX. And 
uh, a couple other companies that are trying to do this sort of thing. And they're also trying to mine asteroids. And the thing is, there are asteroids in our solar system. Like, they found one. It's not even that unique. And it has the minerals in it. It has lots of iron and copper and gold. And the combined GDP of this asteroid is like 10,000 times greater than the GDP of Earth. The entirety of Earth. So, I mean, you have that kind of wealth of riches... You're talking, like, you could eliminate all debt. That's one of the big problems that we have right now, is uh, our, our growing debt and deficit. And you could completely eliminate that just if you mine this one, this single asteroid in the asteroid belt. So that, it's it's kind of weird that this is sort of, it's supposed to be kind of a hopeful book showing about the, the future of space exploration, and it's putting down one of the, the best parts of what, people who actually look at space exploration are excited about. But, so that that's kind of weird right there. So they're mining this asteroid, and they find out that basically another company just got the contract to mine this asteroid, so they have to go home, and just as they find this out, Hal Jordan, who used to be in NASA, meaning that he's kind of older, so Hal Jordan's probably in his at least mid-40s, because he, he's been around for uh, a while. He was at, when America was still America, when NASA was still NASA. He was an astronaut there, and when things went to uh, things went to hell, he got involved in asteroid mining just because it was something to do. It was something to get him off the planet and get him away from the the problems that he was seeing. So then, of course, the. Uh, astronauts, or the they ship, rather, they go into it, and the first thing they see is a Manhunter robot. And then the second thing they see is a uh, power battery, and then the third thing they see is Avin Sir. And Avin Sir is never named. We don't find out his story. We don't find out what he was doing. We don't find out why he had a Manhunter robot. But we do find out what happened here. We do find out sort of the new history of the Green Lantern Corps. And it turns out that the script for the usual Green Lantern story is completely inverted. It used to be that the Guardians of the Universe, they accidentally uh, introduced evil into the universe. And first they created the Manhunter robots to try and quash uh, this, this new evil that was spanning across the galaxy. The Manhunter robots ended up turning evil themselves... So then they realized they had to have a human element in their enforcers, so they created the Green Lanterns to give it a more personal touch. So once Hal Jordan accidentally activates the ring, the Manhunter hits him. All right, yeah. So that's the old script. And we find out the new script is that the Green Lanterns were created first, and the Guardians were concerned that they were getting too out of hand, so they created the Manhunters as a check on the Green Lanterns, and then the Manhunters became too powerful, and they became essentially went beyond their original programming and decided that it was their job to control the entire universe. And so they've been going throughout the galaxy, throughout the universe, taking over planets one at a time and turning them into slave states. Uh, Hal Jordan at this point doesn't know any of that. All he knows is he's getting attacked by a robot, <laughs> the robot uh, smacks him around, but then he is able to channel enough energy to blast this thing. But the thing is, this is a... It's a rusted-out robot. You can tell by the art that it's its not uh, its not a fully functioning Manhunter, and this becomes apparent later when he meets fully functioning Manhunters that have been continuously repaired for hundreds of years, and it turns out that they are... <laughs> Even one of them is a problem for a person with a modern Green Lantern, and it turns out that they like to attack and swarm, so go figure. So he wakes up after the battle of the Manhunter on this planet where he meets Kilowog. And it turns out that Kilowog knows a little bit about the Green Lanterns and what happened to them, and he's the one that tells them that the Manhunters uh, uh, you know, took over and killed all the other Green Lanterns and that his ring has been passed down from one generation to the other for at least several hundred years, 
and he doesn't know any of that stuff. So it goes on, and uh, how do I put this? So I, I don't. One thing that I don't like about Green Lantern Rebirth, and one thing that I don't like about the modern Green Lantern up through Blackest Night and the Third Army, and uh, that geez, that went, series went on way longer than most people think it did. Um, basically, one thing I really, really didn't like that Jeff Johns did was that he made the Green Lanterns like little blue sociopaths. Like they were always emotionally distant. They were always. Uh, you know, very, they had a tendency to be very sort of technocratic and very autocratic so that they, they didn't necessarily see the value in preserving individual life, but they were always on the side of good. And Jeff Johns made it so that they were basically irredeemably evil. And this book kind of does the same thing. It turns out that there's some circumstances that were not really told about. But it, basically, the the guardians are still like the evil ones, and I really have never liked that because they're they're supposed to represent the sort of primordial goodness. And the at one point, a uh, character tells Hal Jordan that the Green Lanterns were created to bring order to the universe, and he's like, "Does order sound like a good idea to you?" And Jordan says, "No." It's like, you know, order can, order is a good thing when chaos is reigning supreme, which in the early days of the universe is what happened. So you could say that the Green Lanterns are sort of a victim of their own success, where they're just not necessary anymore. But that's <clears throat> to say that order is a, is like an inherently bad thing, and to say that the Guardians are just little blue monsters, it's kind of uh, it was always really grimy to me, and it smacks of moral relativism, it smacks of postmodernism. Um, and this book does the same thing, basically. Uh, we do meet a... I'm... Hmm, do I spoil it? I've never cared about spoilers before. I, I feel like spoilers... I feel like if you don't want spoilers, you shouldn't read a review of something. That's generally my feeling. That's generally my viewpoint on it. Uh, so, yeah. Full spoilers from here on out. So we do meet one Green Lantern. Or one guardian, rather. It turned like because Hal Jordan had been told that the central power battery was destroyed. Multiple people told him this, and it turned out it wasn't destroyed. That you literally can't destroy it, but it is in this giant ass containment dome that prevents its power from going out to the other uh, lanterns, so that their rings are just simply going off of a centuries old charge that's slowly waning, so that eventually both the rings and the lanterns will be rendered inert. But this dome here houses the power of the central power battery. So he figures out, because he, it turns out that the Manhunters have turned Oa into a slave world. And the slaves are used to repair the Manhunters because they don't actually have the ability to replicate themselves. So this one guardian tells him all that, and he withholds his name. So we don't know. There's only two guardians that have names that are important. One of them's Ganthet, which is the good one, who gave Kyle Rayner his ring. One of them is the bad one, Krona, who was the one that introduced chaos and evil uh, into the universe in the first place by doing something that he shouldn't have done. And, like I said, full spoilers, turns out that this guy is Krona. Uh, he's, we don't actually hear his name, but he's, he's Krona. So, Hal Jordan now has a fully charged Green Lantern, the first one to have a fully charged ring in centuries. And he uses it to send out a beacon to all the people who still have a ring and brings them all to Oa so that they can try to get this central power battery down. And it, it takes them a while because the Manhunters are their strongest on Oa. And there's a lot of them. And each one of them is more powerful than any single person with a not fully charged ring, which is everybody but Jordan. But they're able to get through it. And we see here, or we met a lot of these lanterns earlier. You can see there's Salak, there's Arisia, who is no longer like a, you know, Arisia in the comics is this really young, like 18 year old, almost schoolgirl type. And here she's like a, you know, middle aged, battle hardened, grizzled war veteran. So that's that's kind of weird. <laughs> um, we this blue this furry dude here who is not. 
oh, what's the squirrel Green Lantern? Or the dog one? Whatever. It, it turns out that's not him. I don't know who the jellyfish one is, but he, he kind of was mentioned a couple times. Uh, but... So all these lanterns that we'd seen and had basically turned Lan- Jordan down as he'd been making his way to Oa, even though he didn't realize he was making his way to Oa. But he, he's he been trying to take down the Manhunters because he's like, well, we can't let this evil stand. He didn't fight evil on his own homeworld when he had the chance. But when he found out about all these Manhunters that were controlling entire worlds, he realized he had to do something. So they rip open the central power battery dome so now they all have fully charged rings you see sinestro there and they're able to destroy all of the manhunters on oa which is not all the manhunters in existence there's still plenty of them out there so we see them they win here they free all the slaves of the manhunters then they vote on a new leader and they choose aresia of all people because aresia was the only one that they had met that had had sort of leadership experience. They don't... We didn't... This is like Sinestro's first appearance in the book. It's these couple of pages here. We hadn't seen him before that. But, um... I saw somebody on Twitter, maybe Trajan, I think, he was talking about Aresia being the, uh, the, the choice for a leader. And I can't figure out if this is them trying to be woke or if this is an in-joke. Because... If you don't know, here's a better shot of her. If you don't know, uh, Green Lantern, the rebooted Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, Space Cop, you know, all that stuff, the Silver Age 1 onward, is very heavily inspired, quote-unquote, by uh, the an old pulp science fiction series called Lensman by... Oh, geez, what was his name? Um, e. e. Something. <laughs> Something. I, I, I'm blanking on the author's name. It's one of those things I tried to read once I had heard that it was a big inspiration for Green Lantern. And I don't know. I couldn't get through it. It was one of those things I would read like five pages of it at a time and then put it down for a week and pick it up next week, read another five pages, that sort of thing. But the basic idea behind Lensman is that there's like the supremely good world and the supremely evil world. And they both choose agents uh, to try to exert their form of, of control over the universe. And the the evil people, whose name I don't remember, they pick, you know, slimy, ambitious types. Whereas the, the good people, they choose agents that have uh, what's called the eyes of an eagle. You know, they have people that are just really driven and ambitious and strong and who always fight for justice. And the good people live on the planet Aresia. And so they, um, and I, I think the book ends with them giving out these sorts of, I, I don't know, these devices that let you have power. I, I, I've never, I didn't actually finish the book, so I'm not sure how it ends. But Aresia, you know, is, is a reference to the fact that Green Lantern owes a lot to this old Lensman series. So, Making her leader could just be an in joke to that. Although the fact that once again, like the Aresia in the comics is really cute, and the Aresia here is obviously really not cute. She kind of has that you know, really bull dyke look to her. Frankly, uh, it's uh, <laughs> not really sure what they were going for. Um, but basically, yeah. So this comic ends with. Hal Jordan returning to Earth, vowing to fight against the fascist regime because now he's got a fully charged Green Lantern ring. There are some references that I don't get. Uh, some references that I do get. So we see uh, the the last remaining Guardian, and he had said before that he had escaped into another dimension, and it turns out that the dimension he escaped to was the antimatter dimension. So we see here that he's on quad with the Weaponeers and who are apparently poised to take over the uh, universe. Uh, he returns to Earth. Apparently, the planet's run by this guy named Colonel Jask. Or Jask. I don't know if this is a in-joke reference to anything or not. Or if that's a, a character in Green Lantern. 
Uh, we see this character who is not Carol Ferris, but is, I don't know, sort of Hal Jordan's like female friend who was the captain on the space mission. And so it ends with him, like I said, vowing to fight against this guy here, Jask. So there's elements of it that I don't like. Um, I'm setting it in the near future is kind of weird. I don't like how it puts down some elements of, of private space travel because I, I just don't feel like there's any cause to do that. Like I said, private space travel is picking up where it used to only be the government. Uh, and just the way they treat some of the characters, I didn't get into it too much, but just some of the things they do, kind of weird. Uh, like I said, the way that they completely recast Aresia, I get that they're going for that. There's other characters in Green Lantern, though, that could fill that role. So I'm not 100% sure why they did that. Um, what else? But, like I said, I do think that effort should be rewarded. You can see the art in this is really brilliant. It does kind of have that sort of haunting extraterrestrial sort of space quality to it. Stop it, phone. Jeez, I hate this phone. <laughs> um, so I, d I really do like the overall feel of this. I do like that they're trying something new. I do like that they're trying something ambitious. Uh, wow, this video went on longer than I expected it to. Okay, I I'm going to end it here. So tell me if you read this. Tell me what you think. Uh, like, comment, subscribe. Uh, tell me if what, I don't know, what you would have done differently. Tell me what you think of these changes they made. Uh, in any case, this is Unring Chevron signing off.